Good morning, Buford Church of God. If you will stand with us this morning and get ready to worship. Everybody just raise your hands right now. We're in the best place that we can be this morning. We just want to lift our praises up to our Savior. We're so excited to be here. Y'all worship with us.
in of the sky Fall out like rain We don't want blessings We just want the blesser Open up the sky Fall out like fire We don't want any, anything Thank you, Jesus. God, that's our prayer today, that earthly things don't matter. All the things around us can fade as long as we have you, God, because you are enough. You supply all of our needs. You are our protector. You bring us peace. You bring us joy. You bring us strength. You bring us healing and deliverance. God, we praise you today. Church, can you just take a minute and praise his name because he's worthy. I thank you, God. I thank you that I don't have to worry about the things around me. I don't have to worry about the people of this world, the things of this world, but you, God, you are worthy and you are all that I need. God, we ask that you would come down. Come down today, God. Be with us. Let us see your glory, God, because you are all that we need. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Can you praise him one more time as you're seated, church? Amen. Amen. I am more and more and more thankful that I don't have to worry. I don't have to look at this world and say, what's going to happen tomorrow? What, where am I going to get the next meal? Where am I going to get funds for this or that? I don't look at this world because if you look at this world, church, you're going to be disappointed. And you're going to be heartbroken. But if you'll just look to Jesus and ask him to come down in your life, he's enough. Amen. Amen. We want to remind you of our giving options. We do not have the ushers that go through the pews right now. But we have a box up here during the next song. If you would like to bring your offering as an act of worship, you can do that. We also have the tithe toss in the foyer. We have a kiosk in the foyer. And we have other online ways to give. You can go through all of those. You can look online for those. And uh, we hope that you will be able to use one of those options. And if you don't, sometimes, you know, if you're not technical savvy, you might think, well, I can't do this online stuff. Just call the church. We can help you. We can walk you through that. But we want you to be able to give in those ways that you want to give. Right now, you can pull out your phone just for right now. You can share our online live stream either through Facebook or BCOG, but that's helping to build our online church. Pastor Octavius is in the office right now talking with those that are a part of our online church. And uh, we thank you for helping us get that word out and get it to more people. The uh, missions crew, we have the Matthew 25 project that we're doing. We talked about last year, uh, last year, last Sunday. We have a coffee mug. It's got a sample of coffee and some chocolates and a little discount card in there for your first order. But every time you get one of those gifts, every time you give to the Matthew 25 project, that goes towards our world mission. So we thank you for being a part of that. And then mark your calendars. This Wednesday night, Dr. Mark Rutland will be with us. We're so excited this will begin his first 10 weeks of teaching and it's going to be out of the book of acts it's power in the time of caesar 
And he's always faithful to bring a great word, and we hope that you are able to join us. You can come in service with us, and you can also catch it online at our uh, website and also on Facebook. So we hope that you'll uh, enjoy those teachings. Are you glad to give today? Has God been good to you in order to give? God, we thank you so much that we're able to give, Lord. Thank you that you bless us in abundance. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Did you hear that? With all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. And I'd like to ask you today, who are you trusting in? Who do you trust? Do you trust your bank account to always have the money right there for you? Do you trust your job, your your career? your boss, to always have that paycheck ready for you? Do you trust our government, old president or new president? Do you trust those people around you to always provide for you? Do you trust your spouse, your family members? All of those things, every single one of them, will bring you failure at some point in your life. They will all let you down because nobody, no one can provide for you but God. No one can bring you the peace that you need. They, they might bring you peace for a season. That money in your bank account flowing through, it might, oh, I can go on vacation this year. I can do this this year. I can do a little bit extra. But those things waste away. If your trust is not in God, then you're going to find heartache time and time and time again. But if you trust in Him and you don't lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways, and one of those ways is bringing our offering. Because when we bring our offering and we drop it and place it in this church, yes, you're saying, Pastor, I trust you. Church, I trust you. But you're also saying, God, I trust you. Because you said you would provide for all of my needs. You said you would take care of me and my family. You promised all of these things. And so I stand on your word, and by faith, I bring that offering to you. And I want to show you some pictures today of some faces that trusted you this past year. These children in Ukraine, you trusted God enough to provide Christmas for them. And every single one of them, they are trusting. And that's how our countenance should be. When we trust God, we say, thank you, Jesus. No matter what it looks like around us, no matter what it looks like in the future. But they trusted us. As we trusted God, you trusted God to bless them this year. And so I say thank you. Thank you for blessing them. Thank you for trusting this church. And most of all, thank you for trusting our God because he is a great God. Amen. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much. I thank you that you are a trustworthy God. I thank you that your word is true and you cannot lie. When you said in your word you would provide for us, you provide for us. When you said you would bring us peace and healing and strength, God, you do it every single time. And so, God, you said in your word, if we would bring our first fruits into the storehouse, you would open up the windows of heaven and pour it out in such abundance that we couldn't contain it. So, God, I ask that you would fulfill those promises in these people today. I pray you'd bless every giver in this house, and I pray it would be in such abundance that they can't contain it. And, God, I pray you'd help us as a church. God, always be good stewards of what you bring and help us bless every child that we can, God, every family around this world, God, and in our communities. And I pray, God, that we would always in everything we do, everything we say, and every amount of money we bring, we would bring you and you alone glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. in my mind that say I'm not enough Every single lie that tells me I will never measure Am 
I'm more than just the sum of every high and every low. Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know. Ooh, oh, you say. Rising again, I'm 
Stand up together and worship the Lord one more time. He's so good to us. Amen. Yeah. 
Heavenly Father, fill this sanctuary with your glory. Let your power be revealed today among us. Let your glory overshadow us right now in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Remain standing with me, please, for the reading of God's Word, 1 Samuel chapter 25. Thank you for being at our church today. We are honored to share this moment with you. This story in 1 Samuel chapter 25 is quite gritty. It dives in on a very sensitive subject of jealousy and anger and vengeance. David was an outcast of Israel. He was running from Saul the king. Saul was trying to kill him because everybody wanted David to be king. And so David was running from Saul in the wilderness, and there, there were a lot of people that gathered around him. 
people of warrior spirit, outcast, rejects from Israel. And they became quite a number. In this particular wilderness area, they protected the flocks and ranch of Nabal. Watching over him, protecting his workers, making sure they had no trouble. It was because of this protection, Nabal experienced a very prosperous year. So David sent a simple request. The men who protected your flocks are hungry. Can we come celebrate with you and feast with the rest of those who worked for you? Nabal responded harshly, condescending to David. Nabal ridiculed David and would not share from the harvest that David protected. And so David and his warriors put their swords on and they're on their way to destroy the house of Nabal. In verse 23... When Abigail saw David, she dismounted quickly from the donkey, fell on her face before David, and bowed down to the ground. So she fell at his feet and said, On me, my Lord, on me let this iniquity be. And please let your maidservant speak in your ears and hear the words of your maidservant. Please let not my Lord regard this scoundrel Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Fool is his name. Folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, since the Lord has held you back from coming into bloodshed, from avenging yourself with your own hand, now then, let your enemies and those who seek harm for my Lord be as Nabal. And now this present which your maidservant has brought, she brought food, she brought supplies. Let this gift which your maidservant has brought to my Lord, let it be given to the young men who follow you. Please forgive the trespass of me. For the Lord will certainly make for you an enduring house because you fight the battles of the Lord. And evil is not found in you throughout your days. Yet a man has risen to pursue you, seek your life. But the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living. With the Lord your God and the lives of your enemies, he shall sling you out as from the pocket of a sling. And it shall come to pass when the Lord has done for my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you ruler over Israel, that this action will be no grief to you nor offense of heart to my Lord, either that you have shed blood without cause or that you have avenged yourself. But when God has dealt with my Lord, please, please remember me. Then David said to Abigail, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. Say amen at the reading of God's word. You may be seated. Dealing with a fool is dangerous. In Proverbs it says, Don't answer a fool in their folly, lest you become like them. However, you have to answer a fool in their folly, lest they become wise in their own eyes. In other words, doesn't matter what you do, it's not going to turn out very well for anybody. And our nation right now is consumed with fools. We are swimming in an ocean of stupid. And if you're not careful, it will cause you to lose your sanity. The only thing worse than dealing with fools is watching people who think they're right take vengeance on fools and make it worse. I don't care which side you're on. 
burning down Seattle and Portland and Minneapolis and Washington, D.C. and Atlanta is not solving any problems in this country. It's just as foolish for you in dealing with foolish action to take the vengeance upon yourself and think that you can somehow fix it by getting into an argument with everybody on social media. Unfriending everybody who doesn't vote your way. Getting rid of your fellowship and your connections simply because you're dealing with what you perceive needs an action of vengeance on your part. I told you these things would come. I prophesied that we would see over the next decade in this country the death of the lukewarm church. And I believe that everyone is hot or cold. There is no in-between. Everybody is so fired up or stone cold. They, they have no middle ground. You're either for or against. Everybody is taking sides. This is an action of God as a sign of the last days. Just as you see... For the first time in the history of humanity, you know exactly how the mark of the beast will work. And you know what kind of pandemic and fear will be used to make sure you take it. Somebody talk to me. We now comprehend and understand how the global war will kill one-third of the planet. We know how biological weapons will be used. We know how every prophecy in the Bible will be fulfilled. We are perfectly educated now. We see it playing out. How dare you act shocked? I can't believe it. What's this world coming to? Exactly where God said it would go. Isn't it comforting to know that we are found in the pages of God's prophetic promise? Isn't it comforting to know that God said these things would happen and the Bible says when you see these things start to happen, lift up your head, your redemption draws nigh. This should not silence the church. It should not scare the church. It should not drive you to foolish acts of vengeance. This should cause you to rejoice. And again I say rejoice. For God is at work. And He is on the move. Everything's going to be alright. I recognize for those of you who are pro-life and pro-constitution. And you want the laws as they were written to be rightly interpreted, not invented, and not legislated from the bench. We have all of these things playing out in our hearts and in our minds. And perhaps now you're watching your issues and your storm and all of those things that you care about. You're worried about the condition of the nation. Let me give you some assurance. God knew all of this before it happened. He knows the end from the beginning. You praised God when you thought everything was going your way. And now you wonder if you've wasted your time now that you have a little setback. I bind that spirit of faithlessness on you in the name of Jesus. If you praised God when things were good, it's high time to praise God when you're worried. You don't have to set your praise and your harps on willow trees saying, how can I sing the songs of Zion in a strange land? The land is strange now. The land is weird now. Everything's going wrong. I bind that spirit in the name of Jesus. We don't praise God because of what they do. We praise God because the Lord is great 
and greatly to be praised. From everlasting to everlasting, his grace calls out to me. So I don't answer to CNN or Fox News or MSNBC. I'm not worried about the IRS or the FBI or the EPA. I'm not concerned what the NFL is going to do or Major League Baseball or soccer stadiums. No, sir. I serve a risen king. I serve a God that says everything's going to be all right. The Bible says heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. He sent his word and it healed them. Stop listening to the devil. Start listening to God. You're going to strap on swords and you're going to go on your little social media. You're going to get on your little kick and you're going to find somebody who gets just as mad as you do and you're going to stir up more trouble than you can cast out of your life. We preach Jesus and Him crucified. Pastor, aren't you concerned about the condition of the nation? Yes, I've been concerned about the condition of the nation since I was old enough to realize that the sexual revolution messed everything up. I've been worried about this nation since they legalized the murder of the unborn. Sinners have been sinners since the dawn of history outside the Garden of Eden. Somebody talk to me. Oh, pastor, it's the, it's the worst. We, we can't possibly overcome this. Have you read the history? Have you talked of, of the Roman barbarism? Do you understand the dynastic rule in Asia and slaughtered thousands? Do you realize what Stalin did in Russia? Have you read any of the Holocaust stories? Do you understand the trail of tears? Can you see the vice of slavery? Do you know what abortion is? Do you understand that sin has always been going on? It has plagued this planet, but that sin didn't stop him from coming the first time, and it's not going to stop him from coming the second time. God knew the sin was coming when he wrote down into the Word that in the last days I'll pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men will dream. Your young men will see. I will do this, says the Lord. Hallelujah. I believe with all of my heart that America is headed toward revival. This election was done in a way that we've never witnessed in the history of mankind. We attempted a, an election that, that is unusual. We did an election by mail. And it's foolish for you to actually believe that somehow America did it perfect. That for the first time, In the history of the world, we invented a system, and the system was flawless. No. Georgia never gets things right the first time. (laughs) Have you guys lived in Georgia long? Olympics came to Georgia. Doing a high jump over a clothesline. (laughs) Had to cancel water polo after the first three or four horses drowned. (laughs) This election is not a representation of everything we can perceive about our culture. Just wait. Settle down. Put this in the hands of God and stop taking things in your own hands and let God sort this out. Quit picking sides from what you're watching on television. You're going to strap on swords and head to a fool's house and leave with the fool's blood on your hands and the judgment of that fool's house resting on your life. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. What do we do in this church? We pray. We talk to God. We ask the Lord to intervene. We don't prophesy our prayers in this church as some are doing now. There are those that pray and there are those that prophesy. Be careful when you take your prayers and you say them in a loud way thinking that your prayers become prophecy just because you're enthusiastic while you say it. Can I teach you something here? Prophecy and prayer are two different things. 
And the problem with you is you try and prophesy while you're praying and you try and pray while you're prophesying. Let me give you an example. I've watched many people go into a hospital room and they need to pray for the individual that's in the bed. And rather than pray for them, they start trying to prophesy what they think is going to happen. They walk in and like any good person who wants good pedigree and resume of God answering all of their prayers, they try and figure out what's going to happen and pray that so that people will think God heard the prayer. Well, they're going to die. God, bring comfort to the family. Lord, we know you can do all things well, but obviously you've given up on this guy. So, Lord, minister to the hopeless. Grace insufficient. Abundance, God, because we call out to you to comfort our hearts as all hope is lost. That's not prayer. You're trying to prophesy. Stop it. When you go in the hospital, pray what you want. God, fix this, please. They don't have to. You've done better than this. You parted the Red Sea. You raised your own son from the dead. You can help them breathe. Pastor, when do you stop praying that? When they're on the other side. But I don't give up praying what I want. I just pray what I want and then say, Nevertheless, Lord, not my will but thine. Stop praying your prophecy and start praying the desires of your heart and let God sort it out. But at the same time, don't start prophesying your prayers, acting like prophesying prayers somehow somehow makes it more true. There's a lot of people who are taking the hopes of their prayer closet and broadcasting it as if it's a faith statement, saying what they want to happen, and they're saying this is prophetic. No, that's praying. You need to learn the difference. If you're going to prophesy, you need two things. A lot of things, but two main ingredients. Number one, you need the Word of God. You need to prophesy the scripture. You need to have the Bible as the foundation of your broadcast. And the second thing that you need to prophesy is the authority of the word. In other words, you've taken the word, you've confirmed it with the authority that's in your life, and you don't speak I, you speak we. This is helping anybody. And so right now, we have, we have a difficulty in our circumstances of life, and we're thinking about taking vengeance in our own hands. But thank God for Abigail. And I, I pray today that God will give this church the eyes of Abigail, the ability to see the king in a slave, the ability to stop a man who's headed toward bloodshed and with gentleness of heart, with that anointing of Esther. Look at that future king and say, I don't want to talk to you today because a fool's in it. Let me talk to the king in you tomorrow. You saw what Abigail did. She gave him a tomorrow. If you don't have a tomorrow, you're miserable. If you don't have a tomorrow, you'll fall into sin. You'll find your comfort in the bottom of a bottle. You'll be in a sexual relationship just to pacify the pain. You'll find a way to deal with what you're going through because you feel like tomorrow is lost and God doesn't care about you anymore. But I believe that God is going to let the spirit of Abigail confront you today and let you know that the best for you is yet to come. The Bible says that tomorrow all things will work together for the good to them that love the Lord, to them that are the called according to his purpose. The Bible says that he has a plan for you, plans to prosper you tomorrow, plans to give you hope and a future. Don't allow the chaos of today to destroy the promise of tomorrow because you act like a fool. No, sir. My God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory. Consider the lilies of the field. Solomon in all his splendor was not arrayed as one of them, and you are more valuable than the lilies of the field. God has a plan for you. And if the plans for this life are not good enough, I promise you that one day the angel's going to shout and the dead in Christ are going to rise and those that are alive and remain shall be called up to meet him in the clouds. We're going to sit down at a table that's going to stretch for miles and miles and miles. There's a city 
whose builder and foundation is God. There's a river that flows from his throne and it runs with crystal waters and one day we'll hear those great celestial words, well done thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. Be thou ruler over many. There's going to be a great getting up morning tomorrow. I want to speak to the king in you. Young people, listen to me. If you only make decisions for your life based on where you are right now, you'll commit all kinds of sin. But if you'll ever get to the place that you know that God's got a plan for you tomorrow, you won't waste your day today. And Abigail had those eyes that could see. Please don't do this, David. You fight the Lord's battles, which means you have a battle to fight, but it's not God's fight. And there's a lot of you who are fighting good fights, but they're not God's fights. Just because it's a good cause does not mean it's a replacement for the God cause. And if you waste your life fighting for good things rather than God things, it's still a foolish waste of time. You fight the Lord's battles. You take up His cause. You're going to be a king. And I brought an offering. And let the sins of these people be on me. How about it, church? Anybody want to help me out with the world right now? God, in the words of Jesus who had the eyes of Abigail, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. All them people up there burning down these cities. People running into Congress, stealing stuff vandalizing all this chaos in our culture they don't know what they're doing oh god if you're going to judge this nation let your sins be right here at the church for if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray turn from their wicked ways and seek my face then I'll hear from heaven forgive their sins and heal their land stop confessing the sins of your culture and start confessing your own sins and God will heal this nation yeah. Yeah. hallelujah I feel the Holy Spirit in this Ah, the eyes of Abigail, the eyes with the ability to see tomorrow. Always unusual characters that have eyes to see a king and a slave, to see victory where there is none. Hebrews chapter 11 has a weird introduction for a woman. I'm sure she would prefer to have it rewritten in the best-selling book of all time. But it said, Rahab the whore hid the spies and was numbered with the righteous. Rahab, when she met those spies, had an unusual testimony. She had a, a life that was of low reputation. Yet when she saw the people of God, she said, I've heard about your God. I have heard. We have heard that, that the Lord parted the Red Sea. We have heard that He is destroying your enemies. And we have heard all of these stories. But I know. That God is with you. And I know that God brought you to this city. And I know I'm not what you're looking for. I'm not qualified. But I want to be numbered with the righteous. Can you save me and my family? And the eyes of Abigail rescued Rahab the whore. Brought her to the family of David. It was his great, great, great grandmother. Did you know that? Rahab. I'll tell you who else had the eyes of Abigail, that thief on the cross. Jesus with nails in his hands and his feet, crown of thorns caused blood to wash over his eyes. He couldn't even see, he couldn't breathe. Cat of nine tails ripped him until he was unrecognizable. His, vision, his visage was torn and this vicious beating that he endured caused him to be just destroyed before death. Bleeding and gasping. Nothing there. Stripped and shamed on top of Golgotha. Disciples walking away. Pilate washing his hands. Pharisees rejoicing. Sadducees clapping their hands. Demons dancing all over the mountain. All of the friends of God walking away from Jesus. And that thief on the cross. 
when you come into your kingdom. Not if. Not maybe. Said what Abigail said. When God does this for you. Takes eyes of Abigail. Takes the eyes of Jesus to be able to see life where there's death. Hope where there's fear. Faith where there's brokenness. Somebody talk to him. When you come into your kingdom, remember me. I don't know what you see right now. I don't know what you're looking at in this place right now. But I promise you that the glory of God is using me right now to let you know that the best is yet to come. You may see a broken nation. You may see a a country that's devastated by sin. You may look around you and all you can see is the clutter and chaos of all that's going on around you and in this world. But if I could give you the eyes of Abigail, if I could cause you to look at this world and see what God sees, you would understand that His Spirit is still hovering over the waters. His power is still alive. Jesus is still raising up mountains. God is still doing mighty exploits. It's not over till it's over. It's time for the church of God to rise up. If there's ever been a time for you to shout and praise the Lord, it's now. If there's ever been a time to glorify His name, it's now. Don't allow your praise to be silenced by these times. Oh no, sir. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Rise up, O captive daughter of Zion. Storm the gates of hell and know that God is with us and He is on our side. He is on our side. The Lord will fix this in the mighty name of Jesus. Stand with me all over the house. I've made up my mind. In Psalm it says this. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are of pure in heart. But as for me, my feet were well nigh slipped when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Because you know what's worse than a fool? It's a fool with money. They use success. Oh, God's blessing me because I have a new Hummer. God's blessing me because he gave me a new position. The Lord is on my side. No, the devil blessed you to build a prison called pride. To protect your disobedience, he has asked for possession of your soul. And he's blessing you in your wickedness so that he can own you and ultimately destroy you. Feet were well nigh slipped when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Happy, drunk, drugs, sleeping around, making money. And I said to myself, surely I've washed my hands in vain. Made my vows and wasted my time. See all of them parading like they won the lottery. Here I am trying to serve God, getting talked about, beat up, chastised church made fun of no until I went to the house of God didn't say just house said to the sanctuary of God that means he wasn't just going to the temple or to the congregation he was actually going into the presence of almighty God see there's a difference in going to church and having church There's a difference in talking at God and talking with God. And when you get into the presence of God, you have divine revelation of what's going to happen to them, what's going to happen to you. And you learn wisdom and patience. It's not them. It's Him. We're not wrestling with flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers rulers of darkness therefore we can't use Facebook to solve our problem because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but they are mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds Satan has succeeded in distracting the church in fighting a battle with a fool rather than fighting a battle with hell You've been in an argument with people and you're wasting God's anointing and you're wasting time. 
I call on you to disengage from the world's battle and get your armor on and re-engage with our fight with hell because I am a witness that whatsoever we bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever we loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And it's time for you, the people of God, to engage what God has commissioned and anointed and appointed you to do. It is time to move mountains by faith and tell the devil where to get off at. If you'll fight God's battles, triumphant and victorious will be the characteristic of your life. If you get involved with every drama of this world, you will live from stress to fear to anger to vengeance to ultimate destruction in your own life. Who's on the Lord's side? You know, that that next day, God judged Nabal. He wouldn't repent. God took him out. Whole house destroyed. Brought word to David. Nabal is dead. That poor family is destitute and broken. Their wealth is gone. And David, the future king of Israel, said, Oh, really? Go get Abigail. (laughs) She's been beaten and abused and ridiculed and lampooned by an abusive, destructive man. You go get her. And we'll show her what a queen feels like when she's treated right in the family of God. Thank you, Jesus. Lead us, Pastor. See you now. Father, I made up my mind. I'm not going to get in a fight with a fool. Weapons of my warfare are not going to be carnal. My weapons are going to be called worship. You know, you've got some great weapons. you got the Word of God, armor of God, family of God. 
the worship of God, the sword of God. You've got all these great weapons. The world's using all their weapons called riots and politics and division, and argument, manipulation. That's the world's weapons. You come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. We put our hope and confidence in God. I want to pray for you today. I want to pray that God protects you and keep you. Watch over you and guard your hearts. Ask God to heal your bodies and provide for the financial miracle that you need. I'm asking God right now to help you disengage from the drama of this world. We're in this world. We're just not of it. We know what's going on. We vote. We work. We pray. It's even right for you to participate in campaigns and to do what you can to advance the cause of Christ, to let His kingdom come. His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But at the end of the day, the results of our endeavor is still in the hands of God. God decides what will happen. The Lord decides what the future holds. He is in control. So I release you from bondage to fear. I release you from the struggle to prophesy the future. To figure out what's going to happen. And I give you patience and peace. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The encouraging word that everything is going to be all right. And on this subject of America, from the blood of our revolution to the barbarism of slavery, to the broken lives on the trail of tears from Georgia to Oklahoma. The Great Depression, the abandoned soldiers in Vietnam, the murder of the unborn, the sexual revolution, the dominance of Hollywood idols on our culture, the worship of Satan with our music. There's never been a day that sin has not plagued our culture. But we are still the, the shining city on a hill. Still a good land with good people in it. And God said He would spare Sodom and Gomorrah if they could find a handful of people who were righteous. And I believe that this nation has a lot more than a handful of people who glorify and call on His name. The devil hates this land. The sins of this land are awful as they are for every land in the world. But I believe in my heart. I'm not prophesying. I'm offering you my faith and my prayer. My faith is in cooperation with the Word of God. That if He would spare Sodom and Gomorrah, You'll spare us. And You won't cast us away. Who else, oh God, has supplied those finances for the missionary endeavors around the world. Who else, oh God, has taken the gospel to the four corners of this world? Who else, oh God, has struggled to put together a desegregated society? Other nations talk of racial prosperity, but there's no one in the country except one race. I've been to Europe. There's no diversity. Australia has no one there except one race. In America, we're the first nation in the history of earth to try and get everybody. And we do a good job most of the time. All I'm saying is, if you were going to write us off, it should have been a long time ago. I plead the blood. 
I don't come to you in my own righteousness. I come in the righteousness of Christ. I come clothed in the blood-stained banner of my salvation. And I'm surrounded by a church that calls on your name. And I know there are those in our country who hate this nation. And I don't understand them. I don't know why you would live somewhere and hate the place where you live. It makes no sense to me. But I'm not in an argument with them. I'm talking to you. And I'm saying to you, I love this land. And I don't want your curse. I want you to bless it. And I don't want you to bless it with money. I want you to bless it with revival so that the prosperity we see is not based on the demonic greed of our culture. It's based upon the provision of heaven provided by a promise that you made to our forefathers. I stand on this good earth and I remind you of the covenant of the pilgrims who declared that this place would be a place of religious freedom where the gospel could be preached, oh God. And I ask you, Lord, don't cast us away, but let us, Lord, dig around the fig tree. Let us fertilize it. It will bring life. Don't pass us by. For if we fail, how will then men know that you gave birth to this great land unless you are with us? Forgive the church for clothing ourselves in greed and prosperity preaching when we should have been bathed in humility and brokenness. Repenting rather than rejoicing in the wickedness of our own heart. Forgive us, O God, for clothing our minds in the lust of this world. Wash us, O God, and make us clean. I bless your life. I pray for you. I love you a lot more than you realize. When you get to heaven, you're going to come up to me when I get there. I promise you this. You're going to walk up to me when you get to heaven. And you're going to say, I had no idea how much you cared. I didn't realize what it meant to have a pastor's heart. But I love you. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind always be at your back. May the sun shine warm on your face and the rains fall softly on your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the hollow of his hand. God bless you. I love you. I'll see you next Sunday.